happy for many things. Good morning, dear Sangha. Mm. Today is uh, Sunday, the 30th, 30th of March, 2014. We are in the Assembly of Stars Meditation Hall of the Dharma Nectar Temple, Lower Hamlet Plum Village. This is uh, our second week of the spring uh, session. When you breathe in, mindfully, you bring your mind home to your body. Your in-breath is like a vehicle, a car, bringing your mind home to your body. It takes only two or three seconds in order for you to bring your mind home to your body. In our daily life, uh, very often our body is there, but our mind is elsewhere. Our mind is in the future, in our projects, in the past, caught in anger, fear, anxiety, and very seldom our mind is with our body. That is why when you bring attention to your in-breath and breathe in, you bring mind, your mind home to your body. It takes only two, three seconds for the mind to go home to the body. And when mind and body are together, you are there. You are truly there. In the here and the now, and you can get in touch with the wonders of life that are available in the here and the now for your transformation and healing. It's very easy to breathe in and to focus your attention only on your in-breath. And it is also very pleasant to do. How wonderful to breathe in. And if you really pay attention to your in-breath, your in-breath becomes the only object of your mind. You are concentrated on your in-breath. You are mindful of your in-breath. And you release everything else. 
you release the past, the future, your projects, your worries, and you become a free person. And therefore, freedom is possible with one in-breath. Mindfulness and concentration directed to your in-breath help you to release everything else, and you become a free person. And if you want to keep that uh, freedom, then you can breathe out also mindfully. Breathing out mindfully, you focus your attention on your out-breath. You are concentrated on your out-breath, and your mind is only with your out-breath. And everything else cannot uh, cling to you, the past the future, your worries, your fear, you are free from, from that. So with the practice of mindful breathing, you can, you can uh, cultivate freedom, and you can preserve that freedom as long as you wish. Two minutes, three minutes, four minutes. If you know how to practice mindful breathing, mindful walking, you keep your freedom. You are not pulled away by the past, by the future, by your worries, by your project. You breathe as a free person and you walk as a free person. And if you are to make a decision, the decision will be good because you are not influenced by your fear, your anger. If you make a decision when you are angry or fearful, that is not a good one. But when you are free, free from anger, from fear, from jealousy, from hate, from the past, from the future, and then you can make the best kind of decision. Next time when you are to make a decision, Restore your freedom by the practice of mindful breathing, mindful walking. And in that state of being free, you can make a good decision for you and for other people. When you spend uh, two hours with your computer, you forget entirely that you have a body. During that time, you are absorbed in your work. And your mind is not with your body. You are not alive, truly alive, during that moment. You are lost in your work, your projects, your thinking, your planning. In Plum Village, uh, many of us uh, have a bell mindfulness in our computer. And every uh, quarter of an hour, uh, you hear the bell mindfulness. And you stop working. You go back to your body by the way of mindful breathing. And you feel alive again. You bring your mind home to your body. You enjoy breathing in and out. You become fully alive. You smile to life. And after that, you continue your work. And that is a good way to uh, not to be uh, pulled away for a long time from the present moment. And that helps you to release the tension in the body and uh, uh, keep your freshness, keep your joy and happiness. The bell of mindfulness is a call, calling back, calling you back to the present moment for you to be alive, 
for you to be free in order to get in touch with the wonders of life that are available in the here and the now. When I do mindful movements, movement, it's not my intention to have a good health, but I just enjoy having a body, enjoy the movements. So joy, happiness is available during the time I practice these mindful movements. You do it for your own enjoyment not for your health or anything else. So, uh, from the parking lot, walking to your office, you might like to walk in such a way that every step can release uh, the tension in your body. Every step can bring you home to the here and the now. So that you can touch the wonderful the wonders of life available in you and around you. If uh, one in-breath can bring you home to your body, to the here and the now, and then one step that you make can also bring you home to the here and the now. You arrive in the here and now with every step. Your destination is not the office, the workplace. Your destination is in the here and the now. And every breath, every step bring you home to the here and the now so that you can be alive. Because uh, we know that the past is already gone and the future is not yet there. There is only one moment when you can be truly alive. That is the present moment. And you have an appointment with life in the present moment. And if you miss the present moment, you miss your appointment with life, which is very serious. You run to the future, you take refuge in the past, and you miss the present moment. That those of us who are caught in the past, who have no capacity to get out of the prison of the past in order to enjoy life in the present moment. And there are those of us who are caught in the prison of the future. We only think of the future. We don't think that happiness is possible in the present moment. So the basic practice is to always go home to the here and the now. And the practice of mindful breathing, mindful walking, can bring you home to the here and the now, body and mind together, so that you can touch the wonders of life that have the power to nourish you and to transform you, to heal you. And that is why when we come to Plum Village, um, we should uh, learn, master the art of breathing, and walking. Uh, these two practices can help us uh, to f- be free from the past, from the future, and to live deeply every moment uh, that is given to us today. <coughs> so from the parking lot, walking to your office, you walk in such a way that each step make you, makes you a free person. You enjoy every step. Every step brings you to the here and the now so that you can get in touch with the blue sky, the beautiful trees, the songs of the birds. Every wonder of life is available in the here and the now. And walking like that, you release the tension in your body with every step. You don't need extra time to practice meditation walk in meditation because from the parking lot to your office, you can walk like that as a free person. You stop all the thinking together. You just enjoy every step and you just feel the presence of uh, the wonders of life in yourself and around you. And every one of us can practice like that.
Last time we uh, have learned the seventh and the eighth exercise of mindful breathing. And you remember, the seventh exercise of mindful breathing is to recognize a painful feeling that is coming up. Breathing in, I'm aware of the pain within myself. Breathing out, I smile to the pain within myself. That is the seventh exercise. a painful feeling coming up. You know it. And as a practitioner, you know how to handle a painful feeling. And the seventh exercise is to recognize the feeling. You do not try to run away from it like many people. You have to be there for your pain. And most of us are afraid to be overwhelmed by the pain inside. The painful feeling, the painful emotion. Not many of us know how to handle a painful feeling, a painful emotion. And most of of us try to run away of cover them up with uh, consumption. We use uh, music, uh, newspapers, television, internet, in order to cover up the pain in us. We do not have the courage to face, to recognize the pain in us. So the practitioner does not do like that. He practices mindful breathing. He practices mindful walking and generating the energy of mindfulness. And with that energy of mindfulness, he is stronger. He can go home to himself and recognize the pain and embrace it like a mother embracing her ailing baby. So the seventh exercise is breathing in, I'm aware of the painful feeling in me. Breathing out, I embrace the painful feeling in me. There is uh, the energy of pain. And there is the energy of mindfulness generated by the practice of of uh, breathing or walking. So it is uh, the second energy that is recognizing the first energy. That is the seventh exercise of mindful breathing proposed by the Buddha. Breathing in, I know that a pleasant, a, a, a painful feeling is in me. Breathing out, I smile, I recognize the, pleasant, the painful feeling in me. And the eighth exercise is to calm down the, the painful feeling, the way uh, a mother uh, holding her ailing baby. So mindfulness is a kind of mother, a big brother, a big sister, holding the child of suffering. So the first thing 
you do is uh, to use the, the energy of mindfulness to recognize the pain. And the second thing you do is to embrace your pain tenderly, like a mother holding her baby. Mother has uh, the energy of uh, tenderness, and that energy of tenderness penetrates into the body of the baby. The baby suffers less in after, after a few minutes. And the baby may stop crying because the energy of my uh, energy of tenderness has penetrated into the baby, energy of pain. So, with the practitioner who knows how to generate the energy of mindfulness and concentration, it is possible to recognize embrace the pain and calm it down by the practice of mindful breathing, mindful walking. You can stay with your pain and you can calm it down. And you are not overwhelmed by the pain because you do have a kind of energy that has the power to recognize and to embrace. And everyone can generate the energy of mindfulness and concentration with the practice of mindful breathing, mindful walking. Mindfulness of breathing, mindfulness of walking. That is the practice. After having hold the baby for a few minutes and helping the baby to suffer less, the mother can find out what is wrong with the baby. The baby may have a fever, or the baby may, may be hungry. And after having discovered that, the mother can change the situation very quickly. And after having used the energy of mindfulness and concentration to embrace your pain, and calm it down, you get the insight as why there is that kind of pain in yourself. And you can find the roots of the pain in yourself. And with the other exercise that follow, you can very well transform the pain in you into something more positive. And we have the exercise number 9, 10, 11, 12. But uh, you are curious to know what is the exercise number 6? And what is the exercise number 5? Number 5, exercise number 5 is to generate a feeling of joy. Generate joy. And the sixth is to generate happiness. A good practitioner can always bring about a feeling of joy whenever she wants. A good practitioner can always generate a feeling of happiness whenever he wants. And how? It's not too difficult. Because when you practice mindful breathing and you breathe in and you bring your mind home to your body, You become fully present in the here and the now. You realize what we call the oneness of body and mind. Mind and body are together. 
And when your mind is with your body, you are established in the here and the now. That's the first step. And when you are established in the here and the now, you are in a position to recognize the many wonders of life, the many conditions of happiness that you already have. And most of us do not believe that happiness is possible in the here and the now. We need to run into the future in order to get some more. And that is why we have, we sacrifice the present moment for the sake of the future. But going home to the here and the now, you will be able to recognize the many conditions of happiness that are already available to you more than enough for you to be happy in the here and the now. More than enough. The French have a, a, a song about that. Qu'est-ce qu'on attend pour être heureux? Why do you have to wait in order to be happy? Because in the here and the now, there are so many conditions of happiness that are only available. Take a piece of paper, write down the conditions of happiness that you have, and you see that one page is not enough, two pages are not enough, three pages are not enough. You are very lucky than many people in the world. And if you are not happy in the here and the now, that's your fault, because you are not there in order to recognize them. So to generate a feeling of joy, it's always possible when you touch the conditions of happiness that are already available to you. Your eyes still in good conditions is already a condition of happiness. You just open your eyes and you see the, f- the face of your beloved one. You see the blue sky, you see the trees, you see uh, the hills. You see the river and the stars. So your eyes is one condition of happiness. And there are plenty of them in your body, conditions of happiness. There are plenty of them around you. And if you are in the here and the now, you can touch many of them. And to generate a feeling of joy or happiness is something very easy to do at any time. With condition that you you have some mindfulness and concentration in you, and you know very well that to have that energy of mindfulness and concentration, you can practice mindful breathing, mindful walking. So that is the fifth exercise of mindful breathing, to generate a feeling of joy whenever you want. The sixth exercise is to generate a feeling of happiness whenever you want. And this is the art of happiness. Creating moments of joy, creating moments of happiness for you and for the other person. If you are not joyful, if you are not happy, you don't have much to offer to him or to her. So to practice generating joy and happiness for you, you have something to offer to him or to her. And the next two exercises, to become aware of the painful feeling and to calm it down, is the art of suffering, the art of handling suffering. And we have learned last time that if we know how to suffer, we suffer much less. We are not overwhelmed by the suffering because we know how to use the energy of mindfulness and concentration to recognize the pain, to embrace it, and to calm it down. It's clear that if you know how to suffer, you suffer much less. And you can go further. You can make good use of the suffering in order to create happiness, the way we use the mud in order to grow lotus flower. 
and it is an art. The art to generate happiness, the art of handling suffering. The fourth exercise and the third is about the body. These four exercises are about the feelings. Pleasant feeling, pleasant feeling, painful feeling, painful feeling. How to generate pleasant feelings? how to handle unpleasant feelings. The third exercise is to recognize, to be aware of your body. Breathing in, I'm aware of my body. Breathing in, I know I have a body. Awareness of body. You bring your mind home and you recognize the existence of your body. It's like uh, you go home and you recognize the feeling of pain. But here, to recognize the presence of your body. And when you are home to your body, you might notice that there is tension, stress, and pain in your body. Because you might have allowed the tension to be accumulated into in your body. You have been working your body very hard. And tension, pain accumulated in your body make you suffer. That is why the third exercise of mindful breathing is to go home to your body and aware of your body. And when you are with your body, you might notice that there is tension and pain in it. That is why you have to use the fourth exercise is to release the tension in your body, calming the body. So the method is exactly the same. Here you are aware of the painful feeling and you calm down the painful feeling. On this side you are aware of your body and then you practice mindful breathing to calm your body to release the tension in your body. That is a practice of uh, relaxation, releasing the tension in the body. And uh, these four exercises are to take care of our body. Why the other exercises uh, are to take care of our feelings. And the first one, is uh, recognizing to be aware of your in-breath and out-breath. Breathing in, I am aware of my in-breath. Breathing out, I am aware of my out-breath. Recognizing your in-breath and your out-breath. That is the first exercise. Every beginner of meditation practices that. It's very easy, but it's very deep. Because you, if you really focus your attention on your in-breath and out-breath, you release everything else and you become a free person. Just paying attention to your in-breath and out-breath can bring great results. And the second 
exercise of mindful breathing is to follow your in-breath and your out-breath. Suppose this marker represents the length of your in-breath. It begins here, it ends here. Maybe three, four seconds. And suppose this finger is your mind. I begin to breathe in. Breathing in, I follow my in-breath all the way through. Breathing out, I follow my out-breath all the way through. My finger sticks to the marker. My mind follows very closely my in-breath and out-breath. There is no interruption. And breathing like that make your mindfulness and concentration more solid, deeper. And if you are more, more mindful, if you are more concentrated, and the pleasure of breathing will be greater, because breathing in and out can be very pleasant. If you suffer when you breathe in, that's not good practice. And when you breathe in and you feel pleasant, wonderful, you enjoy your in-breath, you know that is good practice. To breathe and to be aware that you are alive. That can already bring you a lot of happiness. Because a person who is already dead does not breathe in anymore. As I breathe in, I know I am alive. And to be alive is a miracle. It is the greatest of all miracles. And that insight alone can bring happiness. Just sit there and breathe can make you happy already. So the very simple ex first exercise of mindful breathing can already generate mindfulness, concentration, and bring you a lot of happiness. Whether you are sitting on the grass, or, you, or whether you are sitting uh, at the foot of a tree and breathing, with mindfulness and concentration, you can be a happy person just breathing in and out. Sitting on the bus, sitting on the train also, instead of thinking of this and that, you enjoy breath, breathing in and out, and you enjoy the landscape. is enough for you to learn to train yourself in the art of mindful breathing and walking. And you can experience joy, happiness, and you know how to handle the painful feeling, the painful emotion that is uh, coming up in you. Last time he also spoke about um, listening. We listen to our own suffering. While you hold your suffering tenderly, you can listen to it. Because you, are, you, are, you have mindfulness in you. You have the energy of mindfulness and concentration in you. And you are not afraid of the pain in you. With that energy of mindfulness and concentration, you can look deeply into the nature of your suffering. You can listen to your own suffering. Because your suffering may carry, may carry within itself the suffering of your father, of your mother, of your ancestors. And understanding your suffering, you understand the suffering of your mother, your father, 
and your ancestors. Maybe father and mother did not have, did not know how to transform their suffering, and that is why they have tra- transmitted that block of suffering to us. And we don't know why we suffer that much. The fact is that the suffering in us carries within itself the suffering of our father, our mother, our ancestors, and our nation. That's true. And that is why we need to have the time to listen to our own suffering and to understand. And in order to listen, you need mindfulness and concentration so that you are not afraid of being overwhelmed by the suffering inside. Looking deeply and listen deeply is the act of meditation. To meditate is to have the time to look and to listen. And the object of meditation is our own suffering, our own pain. And if you continue to look, to listen to your pain, your suffering, you come to understand it. And understanding will, be, will bring, always bring compassion. And this is very easy enough to understand. When you look at the other person deeply and with mindfulness, you have a chance to see the suffering in him or in her. That person does not know how to handle the suffering in him. He is, he, he continues to be the victim of his own suffering. He makes himself suffer and he makes the people around suffer, including you. So far, no one has told him. So far, no one has helped him to understand his suffering and to transform his suffering. That is why he continues to suffer and to make the people around suffer. When you suffer, you make people suffer, even the people you love. Therefore, you should try to understand your own suffering in order to suffer less. Because understanding always brings about compassion. When you look at the other person deeply, and if you recognize the suffering in him or in her, that you see that that person is the victim of his own suffering, and suddenly understanding arises in you. And you are not angry at him anymore. You don't want to punish anymore. Your anger vanishes. Instead, you want to do something, to say something to help him or her suffer less. It means that understanding suffering has already brought compassion into your heart. Now you can begin to look at him with compassion and you don't suffer anymore. Compassion make it possible for you to stop suffering. It's very clear that when you understand the suffering of someone, you don't want to punish him anymore. You want to help. So the formula is very, very clear. Understanding brings compassion. And when compassion is there, you don't suffer anymore. No anger. Only the intention to help. So when you look deeply into your own suffering, you see the suffering of your father, your mother, your ancestors, and your nation. And that kind of understanding brings about compassion in your heart and compassion begins to heal you. One thing we have to remember, compassion can heal. 
in us. And that is why all of us should learn how to generate the energy of compassion. Uh, Stanford University has uh, a committee of scientists uh, who studies uh, the effect of compassion, the effect of healing by compassion. And he has spent uh, one evening uh, uh, working with them about how to generate the energy of compassion in order to help heal ourselves and help heal uh, the other uh, people around us. Understanding here means understanding suffering, your own suffering first. Because you have, when you have understood your own suffering, you suffer less. And when you, are, when you understand, you have understood your suffering, it's much easier to understand the suffering of the other person. And this is possible with the practice of listening deeply with compassion and using loving speech. You listen to yourself with compassion and you heal yourself. And then you begin to listen to him or to her with compassion and you help heal him or her. The practice of uh, deep listening, compassionate listening, and loving speech can always restore communication and bring about reconciliation. You have to understand yourself. You have to listen to yourself. You have to reconcile with yourself. Because there may be a conflict, deep conflict within. And once you have been able to reconcile with yourself, you can reconcile very easily with the other person and end the difficulties in your relationship. The other person may have a lot of suffering in him. And he has not been able to listen to his own suffering. And maybe no one has listened to him. And you who, is a, who are a practitioner, you know how to listen to your own suffering. And now you want to listen to the suffering of the other person. You come to him and say, Darling, I know you have suffered quite a lot in the past many years. And this is the practice of loving speech, tender, uh, gentle speech, which is uh, the practice of the fourth uh, mindfulness training. You go to him or to her, And because you have some compassion in your heart, you have seen the suffering in him or in her, that is why you can you can use easily what we call loving speech. You say like this, Darling, my dear friend, I know you have suffered quite a lot during the past many years. And I was not able to help you. In fact, I have reacted in such a way that made the situation worse. I have made you suffer more. I am sorry. Darling, I I have reacted in such a way because I did not see your suffering. I did not understand the suffering in you. 
Darling, it's not my intention to make you suffer. Just because I did not understand the suffering in you. And I believe that if I understood the suffering in you, I would not react like that, the way I have in the past. So you got to help me. Please tell me what is in your heart. Please tell me of your difficulty, your suffering, your frustration. I want to hear. Because I know that if I understand the suffering, I will not react the way I have in the past. You got to help me. If you don't help me, who will help me? That is the kind of speech that we must use in order to open the heart of someone. If you have seen some of his suffering, and if you have some amount of compassion in yourself, you are capable of using that kind of speech that we call loving speech. Darling, I know you have suffered quite a lot. And I have reacted in such a way that makes you suffer more. I'm sorry. It's not my intention to make you suffer like that. It's because I did not understand your suffering. So, darling, please help me. Tell me what is in your heart. Tell me of your suffering, your difficulties, so that I can understand. (coughs) And if we know how to use that kind of speech, we can open the heart of someone. He or she will tell you. And now you have a chance to practice deep listening, compassionate listening. Because the, the, the practice of compassionate listening can heal, can heal a person. One hour of practice of listening can already heal the other person. When you listen, you have to practice what we call mindfulness of compassion in order to keep compassion alive in your heart. Because if you don't train yourself, you cannot listen to him or her. Because what the other person say may trigger anger in you, irritation in you, and when anger comes, you, you cannot, you can no longer listen. You have lost your capacity to listen to him or her. Because what the other person say may, may make you angry. There may be uh, some kind of um, um, bitterness, blames, accusation. And that makes you angry, and you want to correct him or her right away, and you and you transform the session into a debate, and you ruin everything. That is why you have to train yourself first. You train yourself in the art of listening to yourself. You train yourself in order to see the suffering in you, and then you train yourself to see the suffering in him or in her. And you tell yourself, I'm listening to him with only one purpose, to make make him suffer less. The purpose is not to, to, uh, to find the truth, to find out who is right or wrong. The purpose is to help a person to suffer less. I I am going to listen in such a way that can make him suffer less. And therefore, even if he say wrong things, if what he say is full of wrong perceptions, even if there is a lot of bitterness, 
accusation, blames, I continue to listen. I will, I'm, I'm not going to interrupt him and correct him because if I know that if I did and then uh, I will transform the session into a debate. So I make the vow to listen Later on, in three or four or five days, I may have a chance to give him some information so that he can correct his perception, but not now. Now is only to listen. Even if he has, he said wrong things, he had a lot of wrong information, I will not stop him because I know that will spoil the session. So I continue to listen. I would tell myself, poor fellow, he is victim of so many wrong perceptions. But I'm not going to interrupt him now. Because if I did, uh, I spoil the session. So you continue to listen with compassion. You know that you have time later on to help him correct his perception by offering him some information, but not now. And you can sit there and listen for one hour or more. And if you can remember that, remember that the only purpose of your listening is to help him empty his heart and suffer less. And if you can remember that, you nourish compassion in your heart. And compassion is going to protect you and not allow the anger in you to be triggered. That is called the mindfulness of compassion. And during the time you listen to him or to her, practice mindfulness and compassion so that compassion stay with you for the whole session and you are able to listen to him one hour, one hour and a half, and so. <coughs> Our, the retreat that we offer a little bit everywhere, mm. it really lasts uh, six days or at least five days. And uh, on the first, during the first few days, we learn how to recognize our feelings, our uh, emotions. We learn how to get in touch with the wonders of life. And then on, uh, on the third day, we begin to, to learn how to listen to our suffering and to learn about listening to the suffering of the other person. And on the fifth day, we try to apply the practice of my, of, uh, of uh, compassionate listening and loving speech in order to reconcile with the other person. If the other person is in the retreat, that is much easier because that person has been exposed to the teaching and the practice. But if the other person is not in the retreat, you have the right to use your telephone in order to practice deep listening and loving speech. So on the fifth day, you are told that you have a chance to use the practice of mindful of um, compassionate listening and loving speech in order to, to reconcile with the other person. And the miracle of reconciliation always happens in our retreats, everywhere. And on the last day of the retreat, many people came and report about the the fruit of their practice. Many have been able, have been able to reconcile with their 
husband, the wife, the son, and so on. I remember that retreat in uh, Odenburg, North Germany. That morning, four German gentlemen came to me and reported that um, the night before they had been able to reconcile with their father at home. They had used the telephone and to practice. One of them said, Dear Thay, the moment I was making the phone, the phone call, I am calling my father at home. I did not believe I can succeed. Because I was very angry at him. I have made the vow never to go and see him anymore. So I did not believe that I can talk to him the way you told us, using loving speech. But when I hear his voice on the air, at the end of the line, suddenly I found myself capable of talking to him like that. Daddy, I know you have suffered a lot in the past many years. I did not I was not able to help you to suffer less. And I have reacted in such a way that makes you suffer more. Daddy, I'm sorry. It's not my intention to make you suffer like that. Just because I did not see and understand your suffering. I believe that if I understand your suffering, I would not have reacted the way I have and make you suffer like that. I'm sorry. Please tell me, Father, of your suffering, of your difficulties. I want to know. Because I am sure that if I understand your suffering, I would not behave, I would not react the way I have in the past. Please help me. And on the other uh, end of the line, the father began to cry because his son has never talked to him in that way. That is the, the result, the fruit of the practice called loving speech, com- compassionate speech. It always work. If you have some amount of understanding in your heart, if you can see the suffering in the other person, you you can you can speak like that. You need only some time to look deeply and to see the suffering in him or in her to see that he has been the victim of his own suffering for a long time, and he does not need punishment, he needs help. If you have that kind of insight and compassion, you are surely capable to use loving speech. And dear Thay, I have talked with my my father for one hour and a half, and we were able to reconcile. And you know something, dear Thay, the next uh, the first thing I will do after the retreat and to go straight to see him, go to, to his house and visit him. And many people in the retreat have uh, succeeded in the practice of reconciling with the other person.
If you listen, you can listen to him or her. And uh, they will be able to listen to you also and understand your suffering. In Bloomfield, we have uh, in the past uh, sponsor groups of uh, Israelis and Palestinians to come and practice with us. Here, it's very difficult to obtain the visa for Palestinians. We had to work closely with the foreign ministry in order to get a number of visas. And when the, the two groups come to Plum <coughs> it's very difficult in the, in, the, in the beginning. They, don't, they did not look at each other. I guess that when they look at each other, they suffer. So we allow them to stay in different places. And on the first days, uh, we, we have them to practice in order to, to get in touch with the refreshing and healing elements in nature. Walking meditation, sitting meditation, tea meditation, mindful eating, singing songs of the Dharma. And then he initiated them to the practice of listening to their own suffering. Listen to their own suffering. And only in the second week that uh, we bring the two groups together for the practice of listening to each other. One group is invited to speak out. And they have been instructed, instructed that they can tell everything about the suffering. You can tell the other group every kind of suffering that you have undergone, children and about. You can tell them everything, but please use a kind of speech that can help them to understand. Don't, don't blame, don't accuse. Just tell them how you suffer, your children, your adult. Because if you use that kind of speech, you help them to understand. The purpose is to help them to understand your, your own suffering. Do not blame, do not accuse, just tell them of your suffering, the suffering you have undergone. And on the, with the other group who will be practicing hmm, deep listening, uh, we train them to sit, breathe, and listen with the practice of, of compassion, uh, mindfulness of compassion. We listen to them with only one purpose, to help them suffer less, because we know that they also have a lot of suffering in them. So the purpose of this session is just to listen so that they can speak out, empty their heart, and suffer less. So we are not going to interrupt them, even if they have wrong information and so on. <coughs> so both, both uh, groups are for practicing love and speech and compassionate listen. And the mirror when you listen like that, <clears throat> you recognize that on the other side, they have suffered exactly the same, same thing, like on your side, children and adult. Before that, you believe that only you suffer. The other side does not suffer. They are only the cause of your suffering. You believe that the other side 
is the cause of your suffering. But when you suffer, you listen like that, you suddenly realize that they are human beings who have suffered exactly like on your side. At the first time, <clears throat> you see them as living beings full of suffering. And that kind of insight help anger to go down in you. And you begin to look at them with compassion. The first time you see them as living beings who have suffered exactly the same kind of suffering that on this side you have suffered. And when you look with the eyes of compassion, you don't suffer anymore. In the beginning, there was a lot of anger, a lot of suspicion, a lot of fear. But now, since you have been able to see them as human beings who have suffered a lot like you, suddenly you feel compassion is born in your heart. And for the first time, you can look at them with compassion. And when you look like that, you don't suffer anymore. You don't want to retaliate. You don't want to punish them anymore. And you want to say something, to do something to help them suffer less. Transformation begins to take place in you. And we have many sessions like that, succeeding uh, each other. And uh, it's the time for the sign to have the right to speak about their suffering, and the other group will be listening. And a few sessions like that can heal the bo- both, both groups. And many of us who are not Palestinians and Israelis, we sit with them, we walk with them, we eat with them, we bring our mindfulness and concentration as a collective energy to support their practice. And now begin, they begin to eat together, they begin to walk together, even holding hands to walk together. It's very beautiful. And on the last day of the retreat, they always both groups come together as one group and report reported to the whole uh, community about the fruit of their practice. It's very moving to see the transformation and healing taking place. They always promise that when they go back to the Middle East, they will organize practice like that <coughs> so that other Israelis and Palestinians to come and practice and suffer less. And in Plum Village, every year we send a delegation of monks and nuns and lay people to the Middle Middle East and uh, have organized retreats of mindfulness so that uh, people can come and practice with us. We have uh, Sister Thay Nguyen. Thay Nguyen is back already. Thay Nguyen is uh, in Israel with other monks and nuns uh, offering a retreat for uh, people in the Middle East. So, to restore communication and to reconcile is something possible with the practice of mindfulness and concentration. If you know how to practice uh, compassionate listening and loving speech, you can restore communication, you can reconcile. I'd like to tell you this story of a lady in uh, America. She's a Catholic. She wanted to commit suicide because uh, she did not see a way out. The husband was a 
professor, university professor. They have children who are in college. We are in in, uh, students in universities also. But they did not have happiness because uh, there's a lot of anger in him, despair in her, and there is no communication. She described him as a kind of bomb ready to explode at any time. As that lady has a friend who is a, a practitioner, practitioner, a Buddhist practitioner of mindfulness. And the Buddhist lady always try to to get her listen to a Dhamma talk given by Thay. And the talk is uh, about uh, diffusing a bomb. Because uh, she, the Catholic lady always said that my husband is like a bomb. So much anger, ready to explode at any time. So the Buddhist lady said that I have a Dhamma talk given my, my, my teacher about how to def- defuse the bomb. So why don't you listen and learn to help your husband to transform his anger? But that Catholic lady said, that, well, I am a Catholic, why do I have to listen to, <laughs> to a Dhamma talk? So she refused. But one day she was in despair and she telephoned her friend who is a Buddhist practitioner. My dear friend, I'm going to kill myself tonight. And the Buddhist lady said, well, please come and visit me before you do so. Take a taxi. Come. and tell me what is wrong. And then when, when uh, the Catholic lady came, the Buddhist lady said, Dear friend, you had told me, you, had, you have told me several times that I am your best friend. And yet, I don't believe it so much because uh, the only request that I I made is for you to listen to the talk of my teacher, but you refused. How can I believe that you are my best friend? I am your best friend at all. This is kind of challenge. <laughs> and the Catholic lady said, "Well, um, well, to satisfy her, 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 her need, her request is not so, so." so difficult, so I'm going to listen to that talk and I will go home and kill myself later on. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the Buddhist lady was so happy, so she, she gave the cassette tape, because uh, at that time there was no CD, no, no compact disc, and she withdraw and allowed her uh, the Catholic lady to be alone and to listen to the talk. And you know that in the talk, I spoke about compassionate listening, loving speech, in order to restore communication and to reconcile. And the Catholic lady sat down and listened to the whole talk, and something happened in her. And when she finished listening to the talk, she told her friend, I'm going home and help my husband to defuse the bomb in him. I'm going to listen to him with compassion so that he will suffer less. I, I see that he has a lot of suffering in him and I have not helped him at all. I have reacted in such a way that makes him suffer more. 
I'm going to practice deep listening, compassionate listening to help him to suffer less. The Buddhist lady said, well, you have to wait, my dear friend. You need some training before you can do it. It's not just by listening to a tape that you can go and practice right away. My teacher is coming from France to give um, several uh, retreats of mindfulness. And one is right here in California. So why don't you wait for a few days and we will go to the retreat together. And I'm sure that after the retreat you will uh, you will apply the teaching and you will be successful in helping your husband. And the Catholic lady uh, agreed to wait for a few days until they, they came to a retreat. And after, after the retreat, she came home very peacefully and she was determined to practice. That night, she came home and, wa- uh, and walked mindfully and breathing in and out and calm herself. My husband, I know you have suffered so much in the last many years. I could not help you to suffer less. And I have reacted angrily and made you suffer much more. Dear one, it's not my intention to make you suffer like that. Just because I was ignorant, I did not understand the suffering in you. So please help me. Tell me of your suffering. Tell me of your difficulties. Please help me. I need help. And her husband began to cry because the lady has not spoken to him like that for a long time. And that night became a very healing night. They listened to each other. They reconciled. And she was able to convince him to go uh, to the next retreat. Both husband and wife went to the second retreat of mindfulness. And uh, on the last day of retreat, during a tea meditation, The husband told the group, introducing his wife, this is a bodhisattva that has saved my life. She has uh, helped uh, me to heal and to transform. And then uh, if a week after that, there was a day of mindfulness organized in a practice center called uh, Spirit Rock. There were many thousand people coming for the mindfulness day. And the couple came with their three children and attend, attended the day of mindfulness. And uh, we had a chance to meet that group. And they told us the story. The Buddhist lady brought them over, introduced them, and told us the story of, uh, of the transformation healing of uh, the family. And uh, when I give a, when I talk to uh, I remember when one day I talked to a group of Vietnamese Buddhists. I said that uh, that lady, she's a Catholic. She's not a Buddhist. But uh, only after f- five days of retreat, she was able to restore communication and to reconcile with her husband. And you are a Buddhist. And if you cannot do like, like her, your practice is not good enough. 
It's kind of silence, silencing. <laughs> the fact is that Buddhists are not Buddhist. If you know how to practice in <coughs> compassionate listening and loving speech, you'll be able to restore communication and to reconcile. You have to stop that situation of difficult relationship. And if you know how to do it, you can succeed after five days of practice. And I think the, the, in the case of uh, the Israelis and Palestinians, that is a difficult uh, um, case. And that is why if we have uh, difficulties in our relationship, don't despair. There is a way out. You have to go back to yourself, to, to yourself first. <coughs> you are here, and the other person here. You have difficult difficulties in your relationship. You have tried so many times without success. And you are about to give up. You are thinking of divorce. You are thinking of uh, separation. You are thinking of suicide and so on. Because you have tried everything and did not succeed. But when you touch a drama, You see the way. The way is to begin with yourself. Listen to your own suffering. Go home to yourself. Don't try to help the other person. Try to help yourself first. Practice mindful breathing, mindful walking. Go home to yourself and listen to your suffering inside. Because understanding suffering will bring compassion. And compassion is going to heal you and make you suffer less. And then you can help the other person. So the first thing is to you to go home to yourself. The way out is in. And after you have suffered less, after you have uh, generated an amount of understanding and compassion, and then you are ready to go and help him or her. And that is the process. And you don't need to be a Buddhist in order to do that. Everyone can do that and restore communication and reconcile. I think that's good enough for today. Yeah. <laughs>
welcome to Lower Hamlet. Today is a very special day, the Plum Blossom Festival. So after our teacher has left the hall, uh, we will have some of the groups to explain how the day will run. So please leave your headphones on so that uh, you have a privilege. Thank you very much.